Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Let's um, let's go ahead and get started. And I think probably the thing you would like to get started on is the homework. I hope you've had a chance to possibly uh, look it over at least and get an idea whether or not you're going to be able to um, to do it or not. So let me share my screen, and um, we will talk. We we will talk about it. Okay, now I've added the fifth problem. Here's, here's the thing. When you take courses in uh, statistics for engineers or statistics for social scientists, you run up against uh, different tests like the, in distribution, such as the chi-squared, such as the F-test, such as the T-statistic and things of that sort. But you never have any background of where they came from. So I thought number five would be a good, a, a good problem to work on. And where the heck does this chi-squared random variable come from? So that's number five, the chi-squared random variable. It's just a it's, a, it's a derivation. And now you have the tools to derive the probability density function for the chi-squared. So the first thing we ask is, what is the probability density function of the square of a zero mean Gaussian random variable with unit standard deviation? Now, you know in statistics, and we've, show, we've shown this already, you can always take a random variable, subtract its mean, and divide by its standard deviation, and you get something which is a random variable with zero mean and unit variance. And they used to call this uh, the Z statistic. So we're assuming we're starting with the Z statistic. So whatever we're doing, we're subtracting out the mean and dividing by the standard deviation so that the resulting random variable has a mean of uh, zero and a standard deviation of one. And what this does is it, it keeps us from analyzing the more general case where you get more more bells and whistles, you get more parameters playing around and yeah, it just becomes complicated to keep track of. So what is the probability density function of the square of a zero mean Gaussian random variable with a, a standard deviation? Uh, this, by the way, is a chi-squared random variable with one degree of freedom. It's a chi-squared random variable with one degree of freedom. That's what, that's what part A is about. And I'd like you to compute the corresponding characteristic function. You may need to use Wolfram Integral Calculator or Mathematica in order to do that. If your integration skills are not up to par, which I, um, the, the, the integral that you have to do is not a trivial integral, but it's one that can be done on one of these things. Or if you're an old fashioned guy like me, you go to a, the book like Abramowitz and Stegun or Gradstein and Reichek and kind of look up the integral. Okay, so we, we have the PDF in A. In B, I ask you to compute the, uh, uh, compute the corresponding characteristic function. Now there's a problem there's a problem with uh, using the Wolfram integral calculator is that oftentimes you are um, uh, you are timed out. In other words, the problem that you enter takes too much time. And I will tell you that when I did this, just to check it out to see if it worked, I had to take constants out of the integral. So if you have the integral and there's kind of a constant there, and then there's the meat of the integrand, uh, you can always factor the constant out and you don't have to F, ask Wolfram Alpha to keep track of the constant. So in the case that I did it, uh, it worked when I took the, any of the constants out. So I just wrote the constants on a sheet of paper. I got the results and then I folded them back in. Does that make sense? It, uh, it, it doesn't overload in that case. But again, you can use Mathematica or something else. Uh, this is something that you do have to play around with. And then I ask you and see what is the sum of K IID random variables in B. Uh, in other words, the sum of the squares of IID Gaussian random variables or normal random variables. And that turns out to be a chi-squared random variable with uh, K degrees of freedom. And then I ask you here, what is the corresponding, it's right off the screen here, but not by much, what is the corresponding characteristic function? And we know we've been told when we add up IID random variables, how it affects the characteristic function. So this is a very, um, very 
a simple thing to do and then compute and i want to, to compute you can look this up on the web but i want to see the computations the comp compute the mean and standard deviation of this chi squared random variable one of the things that we don't want to see especially at the graduate level is a keyboard engineer that when they get a solution to a problem simply goes to the web there still has to be a little bit of thinking and a little bit of uh a little bit of innovation, a little bit of creativity that goes into things as opposed to looking at everything on the keyboard. So I'd like you to compute the mean and standard deviation, the quiet chi-squared random variable. A uh, hint here, which I haven't written down, is you recall that the second characteristic function is a lot more friendly in computing the mean and standard deviation. So consider in the second one using the second characteristic function of the chi-squared random variable with k degrees of freedom. And the last thing I'd like to, you to show is that the chi-squared random variable is a special case of the gamma random variable. Uh, the gamma random variable has a number of random variables that are special cases. One is the Erlang, E-R-L-A-N-G, the Erlang random variable. And the other one is the chi-squared random variable. They were both special cases of the gamma distribution. And I would just like uh, you to show this because we did talk about the gamma distribution and it turns out that the chi-squared is a special case of the gamma distribution. So that's problem number five. So any questions on this at all? Okay, if there's no questions, are there any questions on the first five problems now that you've had a chance to look at them? By the way, I like to answer questions in class as opposed to one-on-one, -on -one, like through an email, so that everybody can hear the question, everybody gets um, access to my answer, and then everybody has the same amount of information to go forward with. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the reason I would prefer questions to be asked in class. And... Uh, be careful in your questions, and if you want to give away a solution in your question, that's okay. That's okay with me. But recognize that you are giving away a solution to the question if if you ask the proper question. Okay, so any any questions at all? I will clarify, by the way, in number one, that um, in B here, this is about Tammy hosting the men with exactly two children club. And they, they, they get a tally of all the fathers with one son as a, the father at least has one son. And then they want to find out what the probability of the father having two sons, given that the problem, given that the father has one son. And then in B, it says, in addition to the fact we know that he has one son, and here's something very important. Notice that we're talking about the probability of him having one son. It isn't the probability of his oldest son. It isn't the probability that the oldest offspring is a male. It's that either the oldest or the youngest offspring is a male. So in addition to A, we also know a son was born on an even year. And I think I misspoke last time. Uh, what is the chance of the father of the convention? Uh oh, we ran out. Has two male children. And then the clarification is, is that a son means either son if the father has two sons. So either son was born in an either, even year. Either the first one or the second one, or both of them were born on an even year. Either one or the other one. Okay. And so I wanted to give you clarification on that. With that, are there any questions on the other problems? This is going to be due a week from today at midnight, uh, put in box like the homework was. Okay, well, so far so good. This is all very good note, very, very good news. Okay, let's get back to the idea of the average. We're looking at statistics now that we commonly use. These are statistics that we commonly use. Yeah, Theo. Um, I was just gonna say, I, I was still having trouble accessing the slides on the website. Uh, okay, I, uh, just, I just uploaded them about 15 minutes ago. Could you check right now? Sure. I, I had problems uh, after the last Windows update. Okay. And I was not able to open the 
PowerPoint presentations and I had to uh, go to Google it and you have to unblock the files because they are downloaded from the web. And that started to happen uh, one or two weeks ago before I was able to open these presentations. But after that Windows update, I wasn't able anymore. So, so something something happened in Windows because those files are supposed to be there and there is a link to the PowerPoint and you should be able to uh, uh, to download them. Can you view them at least on the web? Um, no. Well, so what happens like if I try to go click on the link to download the 505-AH um, PowerPoint, yes. I get a server error that says 404 not found and then Okay, let uh, me ask, uh, oh, is it a PPT or a PPTX? Um, in the, it's a PPT in the URL. Should I try okay, PPT? now in the X. URL, ah, put, there a, we go. put an X after it. There, that put solved an X. it. So this is my bad. I need to go back and I need to uh, update the links. So Thank all, you, all of the files are PPTX. Okay, now that I know that will be good. Thank you. Okay, I, and I'm sorry that was that was my fault. I should have uh, I should have discovered that. I'll I'll try to go back and change the place where the links are at. Okay, thank you, Theo. Thank you, uh, Glauco. Is it working for you now? Do you know? Uh, yeah. Yes, my problem was a different problem. So. Maybe nobody else is experiencing that problem. So it's, How can it's you have unique problems that nobody else does? Is it because you're from Spain? <laughs> Maybe they use uh, Linux or Apple. I use Windows. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Well, uh, Glauco has more of a computer science background, so. Eh. Yeah, but you're a computer uh, scientist, you get too down in the weeds sometimes. So. Yeah, I used to, uh, usually I, I have always used uh, Linux, but now I just use Windows. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> anymore. Okay. okay. Well, let's try the PPTX and I will, uh, I, I will fix that. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out, Theo. Appreciate it. Okay. Here's the average, the simple, the uh, sample being, we all know that if we have, we, we all know that if we uh, take the summation of a column of random variables like an Excel or something, and we divide them by N, we call that the average, or sometimes it's referred to as the sample mean. Uh, you notice that both of these are interchangeable ideas, the average and the sample mean. So this is the, this is the uh, result that you get by adding up a bunch of random variables and dividing by n. And we're going to assume that they are IID random variables. This is a typical assumption if you have um, uh, statistics from the same population. If you do a measurement, repeated measurement over and over and over and over again, those are going to be IID. Or if you're trying to figure out the average diameter of an apple, and you go pick an apple, one apple at random from the orchard, and you measure its diameter, and go pick another apple from the origin, from the from the uh, orchard, and measure its diameter, and you take n of those apples, and you measure those diameters, and you divide by n, that's the average diameter of the apple. And it's a good assumption that those are IID random variables. They're identically distributed and, uh, and they're independent of each other. The diameter of one apple has in essence, nothing to do with the diameter of another apple. So they're IID random variables. So here is the, um, here is the situation. If they are IID random variables, uh, then good things happen we look before at just the sum. Remember the sum of the random variables? So this is the sum of the random variables. And we, defined, we decided that the characteristic function of the sum was equal to the characteristic function of the random variable. See if you remember this, the distribution of the random variable raised to the nth power, right? That's what we did before. The, the characteristic of the sum is equal to the characteristic function of one of the components raised to the nth power. So let's see how that looks in terms of the, uh, the characteristic function for the average. You can see that the average is nothing more than the sum divided by n. So it should be pretty closely related. So by definition, should could have two little dots here. 
is equal to, by definition, uh, the expected value of e to the j omega a, which is equal to e to the j omega sum over n. And this, um, this sum is, gives us this result up here. And what we get, instead of just having the, um, just getting the result, we get the characteristic of the function of the sum of omega over n. Because if we didn't have this, if we didn't have this in here, that would be the characteristic function of the uh, of the sum, right? If we didn't have this in here, it'd be the characteristic function of the sum. But we have this over n here. So you group the n with the omega, and you get exactly the characteristic of the function, except it's evaluated at where omega divided by n. So that's the that's the characteristic of the average. Let's take this a, the step further. The characteristic function of the of the sum we defied, decided was the characteristic of the individual random variable raised to the nth power. We showed that already. So therefore, the characteristic uh, average of the characteristic function of the average is equal to the characteristic function of the sum of omega over n, which is what we showed before. So here is the final the final takeaway. The characteristic function of the average is equal to the characteristic function of the random variable being measured raised to the nth power uh, as a function of omega over n. So that's the characteristic function of the average. So here's a summary of what we of, of what we're doing. Whoops. Here's a summary of what we've done. Here is uh, the average. Here is the average. Here is what we just derived that the characteristic function of the average was equal to the characteristic of the random variable raised to the nth power of omega over n. So n appears here twice, right? And then uh, the second characteristic function, if you recall, is equal to the log of the characteristic function. And we found out that the second characteristic function is much more friendly for computing the mean and standard deviation. So we're going to look at the second characteristic function. The second characteristic function uh, is just equal to the log of this. And if we take the log of this, we get this result. So it's equal to n times the characteristic function of the random variable with the argument omega over n. With this, we can do some interesting stuff. We know that the derivative of the second characteristic function is, is related, one derivative is related to the mean. So if we do the first derivative of the characteristic function of the average, we get this. which is um, okay, there should be a um, no, okay, which, which which is the derivative of this. And then by the chain rule, you remember the chain rule? It's n times the derivative of this argument. The derivative of this argument with respect to omega is 1 over n, right? if we play the chain rule. So this n, when we differentiate, eats up this n, and we're just left with the characteristic function uh, derivative for the random variable at omega over n. So here's the cool part. The average, the expected value of the average is equal to the expected value of the random variable. We would hope so, because that's what we're trying to measure when we measure the average. We're trying to measure the underlying true mean and the expected value of the average is equal to the expected value of the random variable. So if you have, if you pick a bunch of apples all with different diameters, the, those apples, that population that you're choosing from has an underlying mean, which is X bar. This is, this is the true mean of all of those apples. Say you have a million apples, but you can't measure the diameter of all those million apples. You can only do a thousand of them. So you do a thousand of them you add up the diameters divided by n and you get the average. You're hoping that this average is going to be exactly the same as the mean of the standard deviation of the entire population. Uh, let's hope so. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. 
That's what we're trying to do. The expected value of the average is equal to the expected value of the random variable that we're trying to measure. This just makes intuitive sense. As you can see on the bottom, where in green it says, as it should be. So let's, uh, let's look at the more interesting case of the variance of the average. That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? The variance of the average. Remember, the average is a summation of random variables. So the average itself is a random variable. If you sum up a bunch of random variables, you get a random variable. So that new random variable, which is the average, has its own mean. It has its own standard deviation. And it's related in some sense to the mean and standard deviation of the random variables that we're adding up. So let's see what this is. We know that we get the, uh, the sigma squared or the, the uh, variance, if you will, by the second derivative of the second characteristic function, which is here. And that's equal to n times this. And this is just a little bit of calculus. This is, uh, we know that, that this characteristic function is equal to n times this characteristic function. So we differentiate twice. And what we do by using, again, the chain rule and differentiating twice, we get one over n times the second derivative of the random variable function evaluated at the omega over n. So here's what we get. Minus the variance of a. Remember, if we evaluate the second derivative of the second characteristic function at the origin, we get minus the variance. So that's what we're getting. Here is the second characteristic function at the origin. That's equal to the minus the uh, variance. That's a character. That's something that we showed about the second characteristic function, and we just showed that this is equal to one over n times phi sub x double prime. That's what we got up here. Right. Well, what is phi sub x double prime? That's equal to minus the variance of x. So we come up with this very interesting result, and this is always this is um, this is true if you have iid random variables that the variance of the average is equal to one over n times the variance of x. Now, the average is an estimate of the mean right? And the average is a statistic which should be close to the mean of the random variable we're trying to do. And that average has a mean and it has a standard deviation. So what this shows is that if we take more and more samples, that what happens to the variance of A? The variance of A is decreased. So the dispersion is decreased every step. This is made a little bit more clear in this, uh, in this illustration. We first of all had the random variable uh, corresponding to X. This is the random variable that we're measuring. This is the diameter of apples, if you will. Uh, this is the average of say 20. This is the average of, of, of say 20 apples. And what happens is that the, if we have 20 apples, then this sigma, if we have 20 apples, well, let's not, it doesn't look like 20 apples. Let me ballpark it a little bit. Say we do three apples, okay? Average for three apples. Then this sigma for the blue curve should be equal to sigma squared, uh, well, sigma squared times two. So this variance, if we have three apples, the variance of this curve should be equal to sigma squared over two. That's the variance of this curve. But we know that the variance, not, I'm sorry, uh, sigma squared over three, since we have three apples. But we know that sigma squared, this is the sigma squared for, where the heck did that line come from? I have a pen with a mind of its own. It's demon possessed. So this is the sigma for the average where this is the sigma of the original random variable. And if you average three, then the, the uh, if you take the sigma of the random variable sigma X and divide by three, that is the standard deviation for three samples. So here's the important part. 
is that this variance here for three is equal to sigma x divided by the square root of three. Remember that the sigma measures dispersion and is in the same units as the underlying random variable. So we talk about sigma as terms of the uh, as terms of the stretching, but it turns out that sigma squared is more easy to compute. And then as we get bigger, maybe over here we have sig maybe we have ten samples, right? Maybe you have ten samples. And so over here we would have a sigma of the average. as equal to the sigma of the random variable divided by the square root of 10. Does that make sense? And then what happens as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens to this, uh, the, this probability density function? It begins to collapse, doesn't it? It begins to collapse to kind of a Dirac delta function, which is going to be centered at the mean. And so we're going to have a zero variance in a way. So this really shows the power of, of averages. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this relationship is that the sigma of the average is equal to the sigma of the random variable divided by the square root of n, the sample size. That's something that doesn't go down very fast. The square root of n is really, really slow in terms of its convergence to zero as opposed to, for example, an e to the minus x, which really, whoop, it goes down really, really quickly. Square root of n goes down very, very slowly. So it might take you a lot of samples to get a very accurate, uh, very accurate measure of the mean to, to the precision that you would want to have. So this is true for all IID random variables under the assumption that that random variable has a finite mean and it has a, a, a defined finite variance. So this is not true for the Cauchy and the other bad boys, the one, the, the, some of the Pareto, for example, that don't have uh, first and second and third moments. So if, if the mean is finite and the variance is finite, uh, I think it's, it, it's something which is applicable. Now, many times you can look at the problem and you can assume that it is like the picking apples. If you have a million apples, yeah, it's going to have, it's going to have a true mean and it's going to have a true uh, standard deviation. And you'd like to measure those million apple diameters uh, using the average. So, you know, there it's going to obviously have a finite mean and a finite standard deviation. So that's, uh, that's uh, I, I think, uh, hopefully that's very interesting. And that says why we take averages. And also it's, it satisfies us intuitively that the more samples we take, that the more accurate that we're going to get. That's the reason political polls, they always tell their sample size. How many people, uh, how many people did they sample in their political polls to come up with their result? Because the more people they, they poll, the more accurate the result is. That's, uh, that's very obvious. I hope that's obvious. Now we're going to do something very interesting. Um, we're going to take this concept and we're going to apply it to um, probability and the idea that the average approaches the mean. Let's take the example. Let's take the example where we had the million, the million apples, if you will. Now, it could be that of those million apples and you chose a thousand of them, there is a finite chance that you chose the thousand apples with the largest diameter, isn't it? It's very improbable, but it's possible, isn't it? And if you chose by random the apple, the thousand apples with the largest diameter, then you're not going to get a good representation of the mean from the average, are you? It's going to be, your estimate is going to be way too big. Uh, is there any way around this? There is, but the way to do this is in terms of probability. And we can do this by not talking about it literally approaching it deterministically, but approaching the average approaching the mean probabilistically in something called drum roll. Uh, the, um, the law of large numbers. 
to look at the law of large numbers, we are going to revisit Chebyshev's inequality. Remember Chebyshev's inequality? Chebyshev's inequality? inequality. Uh, now, here is the random variable A, and here is the expected value of A, and the probability that that average is less than its expected value is less than epsilon is equal to the variance of one minus the variance of A over epsilon squared. Okay, you can see this. This is exactly the Chebyshev inequality that we derived previously, except, except here it's specifically applied to the average. Now we're going to take, uh, take account of our previous conclusions, which is that the expected value of A is equal to X bar. In other words, the expected value of the average is equal to the expected value of the random variable. And number two, the variance of the average is equal to one over N times the variance of X. That's the conclusion that we just finished. So let's make these substitutions in here. The A bar becomes the X bar and the variance of A becomes the variance of A over N. Right? And that we've just made those substitutions here. Uh, so that being the case, what happens as n goes to infinity? As n goes to infinity, this is equal to one, isn't it? Now it is greater than or equal to one, but of course probabilities can't be greater than equal to one. So as n goes to infinity, this is exactly equal to one. Can't get any bigger than one, so it just gets it just gets equal to one. So therefore, the probability that this happens, the probability that the average minus uh, minus the mean is less than an arbitrarily small number. I mean, you could put this as like ten to the minus a thousand or something, okay? You can make that arbitrarily small and it doesn't how, matter how small that interval gets, the probability that the average approaches the mean is less than, the magnitude is less than or equal to epsilon goes to zero. So this is how those variances begin to collapse. They collapse, they get smaller, they get smaller, they get smaller, they get smaller. Now this still allows for in the apple orchard to the million apples of getting the thousand apples, which is the, uh, which are the largest. But what's the probability of that happening? Not very big, right? And as you take more and more samples of apples, say the next 2000, then uh, you know that you're, you're gonna be able to get rid of that bias. And eventually you are going to get an average, which in terms of probability gives us, um, gives us the, the underlying mean. That's kind of cool. This is referred to as the weak law of large numbers. The weak law of large numbers as we just derived, uh, this, is, this is the last equation on the previous slide, but the weak law of large numbers says that the, that the limit as n goes to infinity, as the number of samples increases without bound, the probability that the average minus the mean is less than or equal to epsilon is equal to one. So that means, here's a, here's a geometric interpre interpretation, here's X bar, right? X bar lives on the number line somewhere. You compute the average. Now, hopefully the average is going to be close to the mean, right? So you might, uh, you might get this average here as this, and you're hoping that the average is close to the expected value of the underlying random variable, right? What this is saying is that the probability that this distance This is the distance between the average that you measure and the underlying mean. The probability that this is less than epsilon. This is an epsilon neighborhood. In this case, it'd be twice epsilon since it's a two-sided thing. The probability that this distance is less than epsilon uh, goes to one as n goes to infinity. So the probability that your average is out here as n goes to infinity is equal to zero. It cannot be equal to zero outside of there. This cannot happen as n goes to infinity. So this is a limit thing and it gives us assurance that as we take more and more, um, that as we take more and more samples that we get closer and closer of the sample mean or the average to the underlying expected value of the random variable that we're trying to measure. 
Remarks? Yes. In this case, what is Epsilon? Is, is that just let you pick what region um, that you want to assess, like yes. you know, the probability Epsilon. that... Epsilon can be arbitrarily small, and that's the beauty, beauty of this. See, up here, up here, Epsilon is in play, right? We have an expression for Epsilon here and an Epsilon here. So this bound, uh, as this, this bound is indeed a function of Epsilon. But what we're saying is that it doesn't matter what Epsilon is, it doesn't matter what Epsilon is, as N goes to infinity, Epsilon totally departs from the equation. And it doesn't matter what Epsilon is. If Epsilon is equal to uh, uh, 10 to the minus billion, okay? Epsilon can be arbitrarily small, and we're assured that no matter how small this epsilon is, that average is going to be inside that interval. So it's a pretty powerful statement in that, in, in that sense. And yes, we can choose epsilon what, at whatever point we want to. And Chebyshev's inequality says if you choose an epsilon and you take a finite number of samples, then the probability that you're within that epsilon window is uh, is, is given by the right-hand side of the equation here, right? Um, and so there, epsilon matters if you take a finite number. But it's saying that as n increases without bound, that it doesn't matter what epsilon is. No matter how small you make epsilon, that you are going, the probability that the average is less than or equal to x bar is less than uh, epsilon is equal to one. Okay. Uh, you can think of, let me think of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of something with an infinite population. Uh, let's, take, let, let's say you do some experiments in the lab. You can't say that there's a million possible outcomes, right? The number of outcomes is, is infinite, right? Let's assume that we have kind of infinite precision in our measurements, but the number of outcomes is is um, the number of outcomes is unbounded. It's infinite. Is that okay? So we don't have a million apples. We have an infinite number of apples, and we cannot sample all the apples. But we are assured that if we sample enough apples, that we are going to get the underlying mean. Or if we do enough experiments, we are going to get the underlying mean with a probability of one. Okay. This is really weird. Let me, uh, you know, this, this is a little deviation, but let me, uh, let me show you a very interesting example here. Uh, this example is... I think just fascinating. And this is an example of, let's see if this is applicable here. Yeah, I believe that it is. This is an example that real numbers don't exist. Would you like to see that real numbers don't exist? Okay, have I shown this before? Adam, you're the keeper of the memory. Okay, real numbers don't exist. Real numbers, require an infinite precision, correct? Answer is yes. They require an infinite precision. Um, how do you choose a random number? Do you know it's not possible to choose a random number, say on the real line with uniform probability? It's something that you can't do. You have to have an underlying distribution. You cannot choose a random number on the real line uniformly. You have to have some underlying distributions. Very interesting result. But let's look at the uh, let's look at an example of uh, choosing a random number between zero and one. I believe this is from Burrell, and we're going to choose a random number between zero and one. We're going to do it by coin flipping, and we're going to use a binary number. Okay. First thing we're going to do is we're going to flip a coin, and a heads corresponds to a one and a tails corresponds to a zero. Is that okay? Heads corresponds to one, tails corresponds to zero. So we flip a coin and the first thing we get is a heads. So all of a sudden we know if, if, we're, if we're constructing a number in binary, we know that the first value is 0 0.1. So we're 
writing out this number in base two, if you will. So if we get a heads, we get we, we know that we do not have this side, that the number must exist on this side, right? Okay, we're going to flip a coin again. So we get a heads, we flip it again, we get a uh, we get a heads again. So all of a sudden, half of the numbers are killed out. And we know that the point lives on here, right on this interval. So the next thing we do, so our number now becomes 0 0.11. We get a tails, and the tails gives us a 0 0.110, which means that this interval now, that we know that it exists on this interval, this sub-interval, and this part of the interval is out. And you see, we keep on flipping the coins, and we get closer and closer and closer to this randomly generated random number. Is that okay? Now, if the number is real, we are going to have to have our number, I don't know, let's call it uh, X. Our number, if it's gonna be real, must go on forever. Right? So this has infinite precision, which real numbers have. Do you ever think we'll get to the point where we get, um, say, 10 ones in a row? Obviously, we're going to get to a point somewhere out here where we get 10, num 10 numbers in a row, 10 ones in a row. After all, we have an infinite number of digits here in order to characterize it, correct? Um, what about a hundred numbers in a a hundred ones in a row? Yeah, sometimes we'll, we will get, we will get to this. Now, as you know, all computer programs can be reduced to machine language with ones and zeros, right? But let's assume that they can all be ones and zeros. So let's take a, um, let's take a computer program say a computer program that you write that generates, um, I don't know, the number pi, iteration of pi. Uh, and I don't wanna use that because that's confusing, but you write a computer program to do something. You've all written computer programs. Now your computer program is gonna be reduced to, uh, to binary code is gonna be a sequence of numbers like this, right? Correct? And this might be, I don't know, two or three or 5,000 bits, or maybe even a megabit, megabyte, right? Do you think that if we flip this coin far enough that we would get your computer program embedded in this random number? Yes. You're all familiar with ASCII, where you can take a printed text and you can code it in a universally accepted, it's not a very efficient way of doing it, but a universally accepted uh, sequence of ones and zeros, correct? Um, suppose that we took a book. I don't know, what book do you want to take? Let's take the, uh, let's take the book of Genesis, the King James Version of the Old Testament. And let's suppose that that was coded in ASCII. I don't know, that's going to have megabytes in it, isn't it? Do you think that we would run across that in this sequence of ones and zeros eventually? Yeah, we would. What about the ASCII generation of all of the books in the Library of Congress? That would be a really long string, wouldn't it? Is that going to be here? Yes, it is with a probability of one. With a probability of one. I mean, this flipping could be, I mean, we could flip this coin and we could get a, a 0 0.01111111111111. We could get that. In other words, have a billion ones or an infinite number of ones or 10 million ones in a row. We could get that. But what's the probability of that happening? It's zero, isn't it? 
So the point is, is that yes, all of the books of the Library of Congress can be written, uh, can be found in this randomly generated string. You find that fascinating? You should find that fascinating. It's also ridiculous, isn't it? And one of the things that you always get when you deal with the infinite is that you get ridiculous results. And that's a ridiculous results that we get. And notice, this isn't just for this random number that we generate. If we were to repeat the experiment over zero to one, and we were to choose another random number, or we would, yeah, we would choose another random number, go down a different trail, that real number would also have somewhere the binary coding for all of the books of the Library of Congress. And is it possible that we could have these flippings of coins like this? Yes, it could be that they're not there. So we can't guarantee it. But we can say that, yes, we are certain with a probability of, with, with, we are certain in probability that it will contain the ASCII characterization of all of the books of the Library of Congress. And that's for almost every random number that you generate. If you were to generate a random number anywhere by flipping a coin and getting uh, from zero to one. So that shows an example of convergence and probability. We're, we're certain that we're going to have probability of one. Yeah, you know, it could be that you don't have the books of the Library of Congress, but, you know, if you're generating this, then, um, then yeah, the probability of that happening is, is not going to happen. Now, if you if you limited to n coin flips, so you've only had n versions of the binary digits, you wouldn't have the Library of Congress. You might even not even have 10, 10 ones in a row. But if you increase that without bounds, you're sure to get 10 ones in a row. You're sure to get the Book of Genesis, and you're sure to get all of the books of the Library of Congress eventually with probability of one as n increases without bound. So this absurdity, this is an interesting uh, example of, of convergence and probability, number one. But number two, it shows the absurdity of the idea of a real number. And real numbers do not exist uh, in terms of their infinite precision. If we go in the laboratory and we measure, somebody says, hey, I just measured it and it's pi volts. We don't think that that pi goes out to infinite precision. We say that 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 meter or whatever that measurement read 3.14159 volts right we don't go we don't go to infinite precision so everything we do is actually uh, finite precision but the irony is is that uh, all of mathematics at least well the, the the all of physics is based on the concept of real numbers and remarkably it does work any questions on that isn't that a fascinating example of convergence and probability and also an illustration, a serendipity illustration that real numbers themselves do not exist. Do you believe? Do you believe that real numbers don't exist now? Life in the real world. World. What's that? I, I didn't hear you guys spoke at the same time. I said, uh, at least in nature, they doesn't exist. And I think Theo, yeah. Theo said something similar, like yeah. in the real world. Yes. Yeah, like we can't make them in the real world, but we can think of them in our minds. So do they exist or not? In our hearts. Something that exists in your mind that doesn't exist in reality. Uh, does that bother you? It excites it. It's exciting. exciting. <laughs> and it shows, I, I'm working on editing a book right now on the mind, uh, I, I'm sorry, on the um, mind body problem, which talks about the difference between the mind and the body and the characterization of things that can happen inside the mind that don't exist in reality. And all of mathematics, I think, is probably, probably there. There was a physicist, a great uh, physicist, um, Hamming, Richard Hamming, used to work for Bell Labs. And you've probably heard of his name. Anybody heard of Hamming? In DSP, what do they do? He had a Hamming, Hamming window and also the Hamming error correction code. So he worked for Bell Labs and he said something which is astonishing. I wish I had the specific quote, but he says, you know, I find it remarkable 
incredibly remarkable that if you have three stones and then two stones, you can add them up to five stones. And the same thing is applicable if you have three sheep and two sheep. He says, I find this astonishing, but I have a difficulty explaining it to other people, my astonishment at this. And we become so familiar with these ideas of mathematics that we lose our awe of what the mathematics is doing. It's really, it's really incredible stuff. And the fact that mathematics has any, any relationship to reality is simply astonishing. There have been a number of people, oh, who was the first one that wrote the, uh, yeah, something like the astonishing, um, uh, the, the astonished relationship of mathematics to the real world. I mean, it's astonishing. I mean, that's just the way that God made it. And it turns out that the mathematics is very useful. But why? Why is the mathematics useful in reality? All of these abstract things. I, I find it astonishing myself when I think about it in depth. But if I think about it in depth, I can't do any calculations. <laughs> so yeah, I, it's distracting. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's continue here. Okay, so this is the weak law of large numbers. There's another law, okay, and again, the weak law of large numbers says to whatever precision you want, the average is going to approach what you're trying to measure, which is the mean with probability one if you make the measurements arbitrarily large. That's the weak law of large numbers. There is also a strong law of large numbers, which we are not going to prove. It turns out that there's different ways that things can approach other things. We talked about, uh, you know, convergence, kind of a probability. This is a, this is a probability of a limit, which turns out to be a little bit more powerful than what we just proved. Uh, what we just proved would be really strong if we just said that, if we could write this without the probability. If we could just write the limit as n goes to infinity of a minus x bar is less than epsilon is equal to one, this would be without probability. That would be a much stronger sort of convergence than if we included uh, than if we included the probability here. Does that make sense? So there's different types of probability, and there's stronger ways of of converging than other ways. And this is a stronger way of converging, and that is the probability of um, the limit of the average as n goes infinity as it as it increases without bound is equal to x bar is equal to one. It's still not it's still not as strong as it could be. What we would like to see is this. We would like to see this without the probability there, wouldn't we? But we can't, because if we have the million apples and the thousand we chose, there's a chance that they could be the apples with the largest diameters. And so we can't say this all happens all the time, because there's cases that it does happen. And we have to speak of this in terms of, um, in terms of um, uh, probability. So with that, let's move on and see a place where we can apply this. We're all heard about confidence intervals, right? And you're familiar with confidence intervals. Let me show you how the law of large numbers can be applied for what I'm going to call sloppy uh, confidence intervals. Uh, so this is a sloppy con uh, confidence interval for Bernoulli trials. We know that for if we have um, a Bernoulli trial, the probability of success is P and the variance is equal to P times Q or P times one minus P. Now the biggest P can get is one half and the biggest that one minus P can get is one half. And in fact, if you, if you made a plot of P times one minus P, you would get something like this, right? Because if P is equal to zero, it's zero. If P is equal to one, it's equal to zero. So it maxes out here at one fourth. So we always know that, um, we always know that P times one minus P is less than a quarter. So we're gonna use that. So the weak law of large numbers says that the probability that the average the average of a uh, Bernoulli trial minus P is less than E is equal to this. 
And what we can do now is we can put in this variance here. We know that this variance is bounded up here by one quarter. So we're going to get rid of this and put in one quarter over here, OK? And this is for repeated Bernoulli trials, the average of a number of Bernoulli trials. Is that OK? So this is the weak law of large numbers applied to that with this variance. So uh, here, here's, here's the idea behind confidence intervals in general. We want to be 95% or more sure that the result is within 1% of being correct. <laughs> you know, you read that and you go, blah, blah, blah. what does that mean, 95%? Well, you, you really have to sit down and you have to study it. The, um, the idea is that if it's 1% correct, if it's 1% correct, that means that epsilon is equal to 0 0.01. So our epsilon neighborhood around the actual average here is 0. Point, I'm sorry, around the, not around that, around P. We're trying to measure P, the probability. Uh, the epsilon neighborhood around there is 0 0.02 in other words we want to we want to be somewhere within this interval with the probability and then the 95 percent with 95 percent confidence means that we want this right side this probability to be greater than 95 percent so that means that this part which is the right side of the um right side of the law of large numbers if if you will uh should be equal to 0 0.95 so that's the interpretation of this seeming double talk. We want to be 95% or more sure that the result is within 1% of being correct. So if we solve for these two things, we get that N is equal to 50,000. So if we want to be 95% or more sure that the result is within 1% of, of being correct, how many samples do we need to take? It turns out if you solve for these values and that you and solve for N, in other words, you substitute epsilon into this equation, and then you solve for n, a very simple exercise in algebra, we get n is equal to 50,000. So we, according to this Chebyshev inequality, we need at least 50,000 Bernoulli trials to be, if you will, 95% or more sure that the result is within 1% of being correct. So that's how you interpret that's how you interpret these values in the uh, Chebyshev inequality here. Now, the Chebyshev gives very loose bounds. There are better ways to do confidence intervals than I just talked about. And the reason is, is because I made a big, uh, a big assumption. And I surrendered a lot of information when I assumed that P times 1 minus P was always less than or equal to, uh, what, what did I say, a quarter. I, I, you know, that's losing a lot of information in terms of setting this up. So that's what it makes it sloppy. So if we can have a technique which doesn't require that, we're probably going to get better results and not as sloppy a bounds. Okay, with that now, let's look at the variance. We've talked about the sample, uh, sample mean. What about the sample variance? You do not have access to the variance of the random variable if you pick a thousand apples and you're trying to estimate the mean out of a million apples. So you have a million apples, you choose a thousand apples. Uh, you don't have the variance. You, you, you can estimate the mean. That's what we just spent all of our time on. But how do you estimate the variance? Well, you can take the same thing and you can, uh, first of all, assume that the mean is equal to the average. In other words, we've had enough values that the average is about equal to the mean. And then the variance, the sample variance, which turns out to be V, is equal to, this is the definition of the variance, right? Now, there's a lot of stuff, and I don't want to get into this, of whether we should divide by N or whether we should divide by N minus 1. Okay? But this is pretty, pretty simple. Suppose that we had 1, uh, 3, and uh, 5. If we added these up, we would get, oh, let me make it simpler here too. 
If we added these up, we would get 10, right? So the average of these three numbers is one. No, it isn't. The average is what? Tell me what, an, what the average is. Three and a third, mm -hmm. right? Now we're going to square these numbers, four, six, and 25. This turns out to be 35. I don't know what this, uh, if we divide by N, if we divide by N, we get about, I don't know, 11 or 12. 11 and two thirds. 11 and two thirds, okay, thank you. If we divide by two, what do we get? Be 17 and a half, right? Yeah, 17 and a half. So there's a big difference here between 21 and 17. So uh, the point is, is that with the same list of numbers, with the same, same list of numbers, we can also, by squaring each one of the elements in the spreadsheet, for example, we can add up the squares and we can get a sampling of the variance. We can sample the variance also. And so that's what's happening here. And then the variance is equal to uh, the sample variance. The, the sample variance is equal to one over n minus one. Again, sometimes it's n, sometimes it's n minus one. There, there are reasons to do that deeper than we're gonna talk about, uh, times the summation of uh, x sub k minus the average, and we square them. So we can do this from the same list of numbers that we estimate the mean, we can also generate the sample variance from the same data. And it turns out that both A and V can be shown to be independent random variables, that they're independent of random variables. You know, from a Gaussian sense, this kind of makes sense to me that if you have a Gaussian, where that Gaussian is centered has nothing to do with how wide it is, right? Where the Gaussian is centered has nothing to do with how wide it is. So at least in that you know, little, little uh, thought experiment, I can see that the mean and the, vari the sample variance should be independent of each other. And, uh, and anyway, this is the point. Now, can we apply the law of large numbers to this? Can we show that the variance that this sample variance approaches the variance as n goes to infinity? The answer is yes. And the reason it's yes is we're just summing up a different random variable. Let's call this random variable, for example, z sub k. The random variable I just surrounded here is equal to z, to the, uh, z sub k. So we are simply performing an average over z sub k, right? It is the mean, the sample variance is the mean of the z sub k's. It's just a different random variable. So we can apply the law of large numbers to the sample variance too and show that the sample variance approaches as n goes to infinity, the true underlying variance of the, uh, of the probability density function we're trying to estimate. Okay, are there any questions at all? Okay, the last slide has to do with your last homework and we're not going to deal with that here. Uh, so I'm not gonna cover that. This is your homework and I'm sorry, your homework, your, your midterm. Uh, that if x is zero mean Gaussian and um, x is equal to y squared, then if we if we square the Gaussian random variable, we get a chi-squared random variable with one degree of freedom. And if we add up a bunch of those, we get a chi-squared random variable with k degrees of freedom. And that's uh, that's that that's basically your a test examination to show.
okay. So this is all well and good. Let me see if I can um, get up uh, the next result. Yeah, I'm going to show you. Would you like to? Would you like to know how to optimally gamble? Anybody like to know how to optimally gamble? I have a friend in Las Vegas, so I would like it. So okay, I mean, okay. I'm... First of all, know that your intuition is correct. That there is absolutely no way you can win a game and win money in the Las Vegas if the odds of you winning are less than 50%. You can't win. In fact, we've just shown that, haven't we? If you play enough games, then the average, the, the, the sample average, the sample mean or the average is going to approach the mean. So if the casino operators know that the probability of you losing is 0.49%, which I think it is in blackjack, they know that you are, if you play a number of games of blackjack or 21, you're eventually going to lose. They're going to make 51% of the prop, 51% of uh, your money and you're, you're only going to get 49% back. So therefore, in order to gamble and in order to win, you must make sure that the odds are on your side. Now, it turns out that making the odds on your side is something, uh, <laughs> something weird. I'll tell you a couple stories. There's, there's an old story I learned in one of William Dembski's books about changing the underlying rules. If you can change the underlying rules, Turns out that Claude Shannon and one of his compatriots at Bell Labs had the first self-wearable computer, and they went in and they made a decent amount of money, apparently, as the myth goes, in Las Vegas. And they did that by going to the, um, the roulette table. Uh, the roulette table, after a little bit of Monte Carlo simulation, they figured out that the odds weren't uniform that the roulette table wasn't totally uh, synced. It wasn't level or something like that. And so once they found out this disparity, they found out that they could win a little bit more uh, with some certain numbers and they began to bet them. So what they did is they went in and they, they challenged the assumption, the underlying assumption of the game. And by challenging it and possibly changing it, you get, you, you, you can win. That's very interesting. Um, in Bill Dembski's uh, case, there, there was King Olaf, and I forget another, another guy, and they were different kings, uh, and they were going to have a conflict over a piece of land. And they decided instead of having this big fight and having a bunch of people die, that they would get together and they would simply roll a single die. And whatever result came out on the die, or dice, there were two dice. Now let's see. No, there were die, a single die. Okay, I'm thinking through to the end. Let me let me get there. And so the first king came on, and he threw the die, and um, he got a six. Oh, poor King Olaf. Well, King Olaf took the die, and back then they didn't have the craft, craftsmanship that they have now, and the die was probably made out of clay or something. But he threw it with a little bit of anger, and it was hard, and it hit hard, and the die split into two pieces. And two different pieces showed up. And if you ever look closely at a die, you know that the sum of opposite sides is always seven, right? So the die split in two and bloom, there was a four and a three. So he got a seven. So you notice that he changed the, changed the assumptions of the game. And by changing the assumptions of the game, Olaf won. I that would probably be contested, but you know, if it wasn't written down exactly what the rules are, you can see a court of law letting it go through. I don't know what eventually happened. Uh, there's another one, and this is how to win at, um, at, at drawings. Do you ever go to a talk and at the end they give out door prizes by putting in little ballots, putting it in a big box, having somebody come up and grab one and take it out and say the winner is. Let me tell you how to, how to violate the rules there so that you always win. And I've tried this, I, I hesitate to mention it, but I've tried it on more than one occasion and it really works. What you do is you take your ballot that you fill out with your name in it and make it have a larger volume. 
And you do that by crumpling it up, by folding it up like an accordion or something like that, and then put it in the box. What do you think happens when they shake the box? That accordion comes to the top, doesn't it? Yeah, and they're going to draw your name. The other way to do it, I did this once in a uh, when Hugh Ross visited Baylor. I was very, it was almost embarrassing. He handed out little cards. Now, what he wanted to do is to probably get more email addresses of people that he could contact for his, uh, for his reasons to believe organization. So I filled out the card. My wife was there and my brother was there. And we filled out our cards. And I said, Monica, my wife, I said, Monica, you know, fold it, fold it into three parts. She said, okay. And so she folded it into three parts. I did likewise. Well, instead of putting them in a box, what he did is that Hugh Ross shuffled them and then he held up the, uh, he, 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 he held up the cards and then he just reached down and cut them. Guess where he cut them? He cut them in the place that was most widely separated by the folds in my card. And he took that up and he says, first winner is Bob Marks. And I was one of the hosts, so I got really excited. And somebody said, this is rigged, okay. Uh, but anyway, I got the first prize. And then he uh, put my card aside and shuffled them again. And he opened it up and Hugh Ross is a brilliant man. And he recognized what was going on because he picked my wife's card. And I, I knew it was my wife's card because he held it up and it was, it was folded like an accordion. And he says, well, not this one. And so he picked the next one. And that turned out to be my brother because he, he had handed in his card with our others, with the other ones. But guys, that works. So anytime you see a game and you can challenge it, uh, you have a better chance of winning. Uh, there's a book about David and Goliath. You know, Dave, when David faced Goliath, he violated all the assumptions of the rules of, of combat, didn't he? He said, I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put on armor and fight this guy, um, you know, by fisticuffs and trying to punch him and things of that sort. I'm going to change the rules and I'm going to get some well-rounded stones and a sling and I'm going to play by a different set of rules. And he played by a different set of rules and those were the rules that he was able to win by. So anytime you're up against a contestant or uh, up against a contest, always think about the assumptions that they're making about the winning and uh, ways that you can overturn them. So those are three different examples, okay? Now, what we're going to do, and we've run out of time, but what we're going to do here is we are going to uh, look at how you can win under the assumption that you have a greater than 50% probability of winning. And here's the question. You're gonna play a game over and over and over and over again. And you have a certain stash of money that you start with and you have a chance of winning. What percentage of your stash do you bet? Now, if you win, you get back exactly what you bet. If you lose, you lose what you bet. You get the idea? Now, do you wanna bet at all? No, because if you lose the first game, you're out of the game. You don't have any more money, right? Do you want to bet zero? No, you don't want to bet zero because nothing happens if you bet zero. So there's some optimal somewhere in here that lets you know, uh, lets you know where it is. And you know what we're going to show? I'm not going to tell you what we show. Well, I forget what we show. I think we show that uh, the percentage of your stash that you bet last time is twice the probability of winning. So if you have a probability of winning of, uh, no, that wouldn't be it. Maybe it's P over two. Anyway, we'll check it out because I forget what the answer is, but the derivation is really cool and relies heavily on the law of large numbers. Any questions at all? Okay, if not, let's, um, let, let's end this time. And uh, next time we will revisit the exam uh, when we meet. And that'll be your last time to ask questions on it. I suppose that one week from today, you'll also have a chance to ask questions, but um, because the exam is going to be due midnight, if you will, uh, next, next Thursday. Okay, if there's nothing else, are we done? Okay, God bless, be of good cheer. Thanks, Dr. Marks. Okay.